Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. My name is Jed Hearn, author of Across the Broken Stars. I am Dirk Ashton, author of the epic urban fantasy Paternus Trilogy. I'm Rob Hayes, author of uh, Never Die and uh, The War Eternal. I am Michael R. Fletcher, author of Beyond Redemption, the City of Sacrifice series, and some other kind of booky things. And most of my books. And props. And today we are joined by a very special guest, Gareth Hanrahan. Gareth, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, applause. Woo! <laughs> uh, I am Gareth Hanrahan. I wrote The Shadow Saint and The Gutter Prayer, and many, many role playing books. <laughs> Yeah, that's me. And today we're going to be talking about gods and monsters, which if you have read um, The Shadow Saint or The God of Prayer by Gareth, you will know that that is a minor part of the book. Um, <laughs> not really a minor, a very big part of the book. So I was wondering if quickly, Gareth, for people who haven't read The God of Prayer, if you could just give a brief context as to how, um, yeah, the, well, first of all, sort of what the story is about and then how various gods and monsters are a key part of that narrative. Right, uh, the gut, what is it about? I, I don't know, it's about, it's about lots of stuff. Um, but it's basically the story of these uh, three thieves in this fantastical, sort of alchemical powered quasi steampunk city um, who run afoul of all sorts of plots involving what's it, the gods and monsters. Um, the city, uh, Guerdon, is this one neutral place in the midst of this Titanic gods war and the city's alchemists are supplying weapons and monsters to fight the divine spawn of these gods overseas. Excellent. All right. And uh, other hosts have also written uh, various books that have gods and uh, monsters in them as well. So perhaps we could focus on the gods part first. Um, if we just want to go around and kind of briefly describe um, sort of like our main stories that have, yeah, gods featuring in them. Uh, so Dirk, do you want to just kick off first we'll just keep this brief like just uh yeah short sure. introductions just so that listeners know sort of where we're coming from when we're talking about this stuff the paternus trilogy is based on um i mean mo many and most of the characters are from mythology and um they are major many of them are major and minor gods um and monsters demons devils um, from various stories and mythologies from around the world. So um, I wanted to, you know, build, try to build them in a, in a, in kind of a realistic sort of manner so that they were actual real physical, physical characters in today's world. So that's basically where, where mine come from which you know, pick a series i guess i'll talk about the war eternal uh, <laughs> uh there's there's two sets of gods in the war eternal uh there's the rand and the jinn um and uh they are two sort of different species one uh of which deals with very uh, sort of biological type of powers and the other one uh that's the rand and then there's the jinn that deal very much with sort of elemental type powers um and they don't like each other much, so they've been fighting a war for um, ever, <laughs> for uh, eternal times. Eternally a war, uh, and and uh, it's it's generally the other peoples of the world who get caught in the crossfire. Like the uh, City of Sacrifice books, uh, heavy on the Mesoamerican influences, uh, weaving sloppily between Aztec and Incan sort of uh, ideas. Um, the gods are very real, they live at the heart of the city, and if it smells like I've stolen things from maybe Lankmar and Castaneda's alternate reality books and sort of like smashed them together, that's just coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So that's really been useful to sort of set the stage. Um, so I suppose to begin with a really open-ended question, what is it about gods in fantasy books that you find interesting to explore? Gareth, do you want to maybe kick us off? I mean, um, the fascinating thing about like, your active present gods is that you can they can be, be like you know, either like you know, physically there in the world as like you know sort of divine avatars, monsters, whatever, 
but also they can be sort of like, you know active spiritual forces like sort of pushing the characters one way or another inspiring them sending them omens and dreams they can like sort of be sort of like you know all those the incarnations of plots effectively or sort of plot elements pushing things pushing and pushing events and because they're like you know spiritually omnipresent you can't easily get away from them you can reject them or turn them or fight them but you can't like you know, you could you could leave a kingdom you could leave a village you're gonna like, you know, sail overseas but it's hard, not hard to get away from basically sort of, like, sort of active incarnation part of the universe um and the other thing that's fascinating is that like you know, that that's as far as i'm aware doesn't exist in real life so you have this like you know weird spiritual pressure that isn't that on the characters that isn't there in real life you can sort of explore that and I think particularly one the, of the most oh yeah, go ahead, Rob. Sorry, one of the most interesting things is the way that uh, you have saints playing a part actually in 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 your world, Gareth. Because obviously, yeah, you, you have the god. Well, yeah, shadow saint. Uh, you have the gods, um, but then they they have the ability to sort of like choose sort of avatars, as it were, that are sort of like their saints. And uh, I thought that was a quite an interesting concept. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of not stole, but like you know, inspired by um, Tim Powers and a role to game called Unknown Armies, where there, there are these basically sort of spiritual forces, these archetypes, and you, like you know, the archetype like the masterless man or the mother or the flying woman or the gunslinger or something, and you sort of channel them. Um, so basically, I, I've always been fascinated by that idea that you can sort of align yourself with this sort of spiritual force and gain power that way. And yeah, so sort, of, sort of stuck that in, but that that sort of ups the stakes of like you know your sort of your relationship with the goal. It's not just a, a moral thing. There's a a degree of like you know power power agency in the world that comes from being aligned with one god or another. I think that's what's so fascinating about it to me is like there is something different about the conflict between a character and a god in a story as opposed to a character and another just more powerful character and i think yeah as you say it is that like those sort of uneasy conflicts and um questions that come into play where you're like this person is a is a deity like should i be worshiping them like what should my be reaction be towards um yeah this entity and it, yeah it, it does add like this extra layer of conflict which is really interesting um plus you, you, you can't reason with them as well like you know yes that's if, it if, yeah if, if you're arguing with someone like they might not agree with you, but but like there's at least the possibility that they would be able to change their mind. Whereas like you know, if you have like the god of war, yeah. you cannot say like you know, actually we should be peaceful. Peace is good because inherently like, you know, he's a tribe. Exactly. He cannot agree to that. You're right. They're almost like forces of nature that take more yeah. of an interest in your life, in some ways. Gravity you can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Gravity you can you, talk to. You, 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 you still fall, you still don't fall off the cliff, but like, you know, it'll, it'll take interest you on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> it's, wow. Uh, it's, I, I, I find it fascinating how the, you sort of different, sto different authors, different stories, different books uh, use gods in different ways, because obviously yours are these very um, powerful, enigmatic creatures, uh, entities that, you know, sort of like take control of the world and try to uh, manipulate things that way. Whereas like Dirk's gods are very uh, different. They don't, they don't feel as powerful because they're sort of, they're more like, um, they're more like people, I guess, hmm. which, and it's a, it's a very different way of sort of handling it. I feel. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk to that a bit, Dirk? Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things, I mean, the, uh, two things that always fascinate me about, about, about fantasy and one of the reasons I love fantasy is that, I mean, so many fantasy books have gods of sorts, right? Um, and a lot of this just draws, it comes from our age old fantasy, uh, fascination with mythology, you know, with various gods like the Greek gods manipulating human populations and, and, um, and uh, gods coming down and, mating with humans or animals or whatever and creating these special people in history and and mythology and uh what and then the other thing that always fascinates me is that the different approaches that authors take um to create uh their hierarchy of gods and their world of god 
I mean, and it's the, the, one of the hardest parts as an author addressing writers that might be watching for me is, was how powerful do we make them, right? Yes. How, how much can they do? Um, and how much more can they do throughout the series? Um, and then also, do I want to make them, do I want to give them more human-like traits? Or are they truly just these all-powerful intelligences that can go like this and universes will, you know, pop into existence? Um, and, uh, uh, the one of the hardest parts is is the progression and as as one very powerful god runs it up into an or character runs into another one who is more powerful right and how they re, how they react to that because all of my characters do they my premise is that they they all all the mythology mythological uh, beings um, from around the world, different mythologies from from every, every exist, and some of them are still alive, um, but they've been hiding. Uh, so they've been uh, interacting um, or hiding from human beings, or have in the past, and they've they've all developed, and they all have human characteristics and feelings and. Um, things that they can do and things that they can't do and how different authors develop those things is always really really interesting to me because it's so that's so easy to screw up um, yes. either you go too much too far or too little and and to make them if sometimes they're characters that are out and above you know and they're not really main but sometimes, like in in my story in particular, they are they are main characters. You make um, them very human, very relatable, um, right? To the point where you know, as a as a reader, you 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 care about them. You sort of like you know, you're you sat there reading about the gods, and they they feel very very human almost, and you care about them. Whereas in, in something like Garrus books, they're obviously they're these terrifying entities, and they are terrifying. Particularly, yeah. I remember one chapter from the God of Prayer stands out to me a lot where a lot of the story is just focused in Gerdon, which doesn't really have a massive God presence in it um, initially in the book. But then you do this chapter where you show the God's war that's occurring in other places. And yeah, just the level of power and brutality that is unfolding um, in this battle is, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's quite terrifying to behold, especially because you're like aware of the fact that Gerdon is a little bit of a safe haven against this. But um, I'm really glad that you brought up that idea of power levels, Dirk, because that's literally one of the questions I have written down in my notebook. <laughs> and yeah, I was just, I'd be curious to hear, Gareth, how, how you have sort of managed that in your book, because it feels like you've sort of done almost a very different, um, yeah, as, as Rob says, you've done a very different way of, you know, managing the gods' power levels compared to, say, Dirk. I think the, the trade-off is, is sort of like, you know, power versus, oh my God. Effectiveness is the wrong word, but like sort of like you know, sort of agency or part of control. Like you know, hmm. the gods in the God of Prayer are like you know, supremely powerful, certainly, but their ability to like you know, affect you know, useful change in the mortal world is, is kind of limited because they, they work through saying something like, like you know, a god of fire could like you know, can inherently can like you know, blow up a city, but it can't build can't do it's all it's only thing is is burning stuff so if its followers want to anything else they've got to either like you know trade with someone or black belt someone and go like you know if you like you know, if you don't pay us we will burn down your city um whereas a like you know sort of more sort of classical like a you know, greek god where, where it's a person as well as being a god it may not be as inherently like you know powerful but it can like you know show up and go Hi, I'm the God of Fire. Bring, bring, bring me grapes and I won't consider it your study. It can have personality, can have relationships, whereas a more sort of elemental, abstract God can also in the same way. You can have relationships with the characters who worship it or insane sort of in my books, but not, not the God itself. 
That's really interesting. And I think, Rob, you almost do a little bit of a similar thing in the War Eternal. Like, even though the Jin and the Rand are, like, very powerful, they do need humans for certain activities. And the way that they kind of try to get those humans to, you know, follow their commands is by, yeah, threatening them with the area that they have a lot of leverage in. Um, we should be talking about monsters a little bit as well, but first we'll get uh, Fletcher to talk about gods. But before that, we need to pause for our featured book for this episode, which is by our very own special guest, Gareth. Do you want to tell us about your featured book? Uh, I shall, I guess, be quite shameless and plug my latest book, which hey. is... We will plug it with you as well. <laughs> the sequel's together, apparently. You, you can't plug it, you've already guessed. I see Rob heroically plugging it there. Um, yeah. Uh, it's book two of the series. Um, in book one, Ger Gerdon was fairly safe from the war. In book two, the war shows up. Um, it's more of a sort of, uh, sort of a magical espionage thriller in parts. Um, there's a heavy John le Carré influence in parts. Um, there's lots of political shenanigans, and then there's like you know lots of things exploding. So yeah. Book two. Excellent. And that it's is fantastic. The they both are. Go and read them. Here it is. Uh, the link to that will be in the show notes as always. Um, or you can just search it up if you are clever and can manually find books that way. Um, Mike, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you have managed uh, power levels with your gods or just any other sort of things yeah, related okay. to gods um, before we move uh, on? To so power levels are dangerous, right? Because um, an all powerful god. Uh, is in a way a plot crusher uh, <laughs> because nothing matters because it's just gonna win, right? Um, so it's like like anything. I treat my gods like characters. They have their own personalities. They have their own flaws. They have goals. Um, tie it all to my contention that plot is a myth and the character is everything. But anyway, um, so the way I sort of tried to get past that, at least in the City of Sacrifice series, is um, the gods are limited in their power, not so much due to, you know, their power being limited, but more fear of the other gods. So this is a post-apocalyptic fantasy. The world is largely dead because the gods have warred amongst each other pretty much at will and destroyed the world. And so they've come to this sort of truce, uh, you know, hunkered down in this last city and really the only thing that's saving reality at that point is the fact that the gods are unwilling to meddle further, at least directly. Um, so while one of them could wander in and change the path of, you know, civilization, if they do, the other gods are going to be like, shit, he broke the truce, we're in there too. Um, and so you end up with these sort of extremely terrifying, powerful gods reduced to meddling and manipulating people um, from the background uh, in this dead world. So I, I think it's, it's like, like any magic system, the, your gods are part of that. Um, you have to understand the rules and I think they're probably, well for me, not everyone loves a sort of ordered magic system, but I do. Um, you know, you, do. you, you gotta have, some, there's gotta be some limitations there. That's really interesting how we're picking up the same themes here of like, yeah, limitations and rules and like, yeah, from those constraints seems to come the most interesting stuff. The, the same way, the, sorry, how, how I, um, I mean, in, in, in book three, I'll try not to be too spoilerish. I do introduce a different level of godlike beings who could just go like that and change you know snap their fingers and 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 change everything but they have rules that they follow um and that's the only thing that makes the plot just make no sense just like mike said um they've got their there are reasons why they do and don't do things um and they simply believe that they can't so that's you know there's once things once things become so beings become so powerful you you have to be able to rein them in somehow um otherwise why didn't they just do this at the beginning go back in time and just make it not happen you know it's just exactly. you know, I, I had to you know it, it's not easy laying that stuff out but it is a lot of fun actually trying to figure those things out 
Awesome. All right. So uh, I feel like uh, yes, it, it ties into the the same idea of like having a magic system. You, you've kind of like with a magic system. I mean, you can have the type of magic system where anything is possible and they can do anything. That sort of really soft magic system. But then, I mean, for me, that kind of goes the way of of well, the character at the end can just be like, I win. Mm. Um, whereas if you build your magic system as a, as a hard magic system with inherent rules of what can and can't be done, then I find it makes it a lot more, makes it a lot more interesting because you're not just waiting for somebody to come along with a, you know, an I win button or whatever. Yes, it's Pacino. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do we want to transition into talking about monsters since we've uh, discussed gods at length here? Mike is a monster. Like it's a monster. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so actually, uh, Gareth, uh, I'm probably screwing up the names. It's been actually a year or two since I read uh, Gutter Prayers. I, I caught a very early arc. Uh, the Waxmen. Oh, the Tottenham. Oh, Fucking oh, no. yes. Brilliant. Like I read that and that was like, that was my jealousy moment. Of, and you said it was absolutely stunning as well, according to the <laughs> cover blurb on the back of like, the Shadow Saint. The burning wicks, limitations, and it was so... The human monster is always my favorite monster. That's why I tend not to write books with monsters in because I'm like, eh, who gives a fuck about orcs? Sorry. Uh, but <laughs> Sorry, orcs. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But like that, that was brilliant. To me, those were brilliant monsters and they were terrifying. Yes. Yeah. So good. Yeah, do you want to talk to those? That. Do you want to talk to those a bit more just for like readers? Did you come up with the idea. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> So my, 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 my day job, so to speak, is doing role-playing games. So I've made a, an awful lot of monsters for that, for like you know, various Dungeons and Dragons-esque things. And actually, Talman came from that. He, there's a very, very obscure monster book I wrote like you know, tw 10 years ago or 20 years ago at this point, which has like you know, a very early version of Talman in them. Oh. Um, but I mean, with, with any monster, for me anyway, so the key is finding sort of, sort of visceral hook that you can sort of like, you know, stick onto it that makes it different from just like, you know, you know a, a, a thing of claws and teeth or whatever. You can, you, you, you can be, a wolf can be threatening, but for it to be a, a real monster, it has to sort of disturb the reader on some level or like, you know, sort of, uh, like sort of create a, a, a new or unexpected fear. Like for the, for the Talaman, I find just, just the, the, the phys this sort of physical texture wax to be weird and off-putting. Yeah, so it's so soft and hot and hard. It like flows, but it's solid. And it, I I'm just probably something deeply Freudian about being freaked out by candles. But anyway, <laughs> I just took all that and said, right, like, you know, okay, stick, stick that on legs and give it a knife and a grin, and off it goes. And also the relentless determination with which they pursue people. That to me was almost a big part of what made their character design so terrifying. Is just the fact the that they were made out of wax. Yeah. Literally, yeah, they were just, yeah, these like single minded guards who, if you cross them, they would not stop. And like that just added to all those other things. Amazing. The thing is, the thing is what, what makes it so interesting there is they will stop because, because of it, they're, they're literal candles. And it doesn't actually come from the old the books, but it's from writing. Yeah. And they will burn down over time. They have to be renewed. So these guys have their like sort of like, desperate, you know, if they don't get you within like, you know, 72 hours or whatever then they themselves will be destroyed. So they, they're going, ah, must get, must get killed. That's why they're so relentless because... That's true, actually, yeah. I hadn't, yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah, that's good. But th 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 that bit apart is... It, it, they've mentioned this uh, aside once or twice in the book, but it's not... It's never like a plot. But it was in my head when I was writing them, that they, you know, they would not give up because they're screwed if they do. Ah, I see. So that was like... Yeah, that it was built like, into their motivations, motivations and everything. Exactly. Even that's that, that's very page. Sort of viewpoint almost, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, there's another monster in there which again doesn't show up a huge bit in the book. Um, the gun heads for these, uh, yeah. um, like you know, sort of human hybrids. I mean, on like the face of it, a like you know, what they're described as the basically like you know, sort of basically like, you know, sort of muscle bound wrestlers with the heads of gulls, <laughs> which is on the face of it a absurd and like you know, a silly concept. But I, I remember years ago, I was watching, watching, literally watching like, the birds or something, and there's a close up of this like, you know, seagull's face with like, you know, this sort of like, you know, serrated beak and the tongue and the crazy eyes. 
and that's always stayed with me. I think you, you sort of take something that freaks you out and stick with it and exaggerate it. You can make anything scary and disturbing and make me into a monster. I'm really glad you brought up that because today my friend showed me a video of a seagull eating a dead rabbit. And it is such a disturbing video because you're like, how can this fit in the seagull's beak? But it does. And its neck like swells up and it's, yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> it definitely would make, yeah, for quite a, quite a scary monster. I don't know if this... Um, probably why so many monsters have eight legs because spiders are such yeah. a sort of like, everybody yeah. is freaked out by... Well, not everybody, but so many people are freaked out by spiders. So it's like, well, the first and easiest way to make a monster a bit scary is just give it eight legs. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> I don't know if this counts as a monster, but I also found um, the stone men very interesting from the gutter prayer as well. And as you've said, it kind of has that same thing where it's a... What did you say? Like a... Um, a new and unexpected fear which is quite disturbing to readers because it's this idea that you could become you know petrified in your body which like it does exist with you know some diseases and everything but just the way that you described it made it yeah very interesting so yeah do you want to talk about that a little bit well i mean um with them as part of it was uh, around the time i'd written the book i turned my back and i was like having trouble walking and so forth so a lot of like you know, that fear I, I mean it wasn't like that bad it wasn't like you know so sort of permanent disabled or anything, but just I, I had a sort of disc in my back, so I, walking was extremely painful for a while. So a lot of that, like sort of feeling of, like losing mobility and losing, and sort of feeling like you know, something like, sort of wrong inside your body that's getting worse. I sort of like put, put, that, put that onto the page, um, and that they like sort of brought, brought as well, like you know, fears of being buried alive and so forth, and sort of, sort of conflation of the two. But anything that is sort of like, you know, biological is going to be sort of like, you know, as I said, visceral. So you should grab the reader that way. That is a good, yeah, way to think about it. Biological related fears. Um, opening up this up to uh, Dirk and Mike and Rob, what are your thoughts on what makes a good monster in a fantasy book? I am. Um, <coughs> with my books, I pulled them all from myths and legends. Um, and then it was just trying to uh, give them a, a twist. Um, I mean, I have some of the main characters are but not necessarily gods, but monsters, um, like the, um, the Cerberus triplets. Um, and, you know, the, a lot more of them show up in book three. But uh, it was just uh, trying to make them uh, bring them kind of alive and make them scary. There's it's one thing that I always think about is that there's this awesome book by a, a film theorist called The Poetics of Horror, where he talks talks about the inter. I can't remember the name of the author. I'll find it. Um, it he talks about the interstitial uh, uh, nature of nearly every monster, and by that they're part one thing and part another thing. Um, or part several things in general, um, even even made up monsters, um, and that can include part alive and part dead. And uh, it's really really a fascinating read. I try to I, I I actually have seen that in so many books uh, where where they do that, and and then the kind of powers they have and the kind of things that <coughs> that they do are of course awful. Um, but they're awful in, in different and certain specific ways. And the things they can do and, and the ways they think or don't think. Some of the most frightening, like zombies, right? Part alive, part dead. They, haven't, they don't think. And that's part of what makes them so terrifying. And like Robert J. Bennett in his City of Stairs and uh, whatever. I can't remember the name of that series. Miracles and Twin Cities. Yeah, he, he creates just absolutely fascinating monsters um, that, you know, that are like, like Gareth's and like, like so many in fantasy, they're, they're created, they're made up. And, and I, you know, I haven't <clears throat> had an opportunity to do that in my writing yet. And I'm always really, really uh, fascinated by how other people um, in their books do you know actually create these monsters um and you know what what inspires my inspiration is easy you know because they are 
the Egamuksa. They are um, the ver various, the Nagual, the various monsters from all over the, all over the world. So, but what, it, what inspires you and how you decide to come up with things is what really, really always is exciting to me. Yeah. There's there's a level at which, um, because of, you know, I guess the time that I grew up reading fantasy, I kind of think, like, it's not really a fantasy book unless you've got some sort of cool fantasy monsters in it. And yet, every time I come to write a fantasy book, like, in the back of my head, I'm, I'm half thinking, like, what's going to be the cool monster in this book? I haven't had a monster in a single book, because by the time I get into there and I realize that my characters are all the monsters due to possibly some obsessions and fascinations and whatever issues. Um, it just seems like overkill, like really? Like I'm gonna put together some sort of like cool, now here's a, here's a dragon or something. It's like, it's, there, there are too many monsters in there already. Well, you're any, uh, in Beyond Redemption, you have characters who are monsters. I mean, they are, you know, there are some, based on their you know uh, their their personal personal psychological state um become basically where where creatures they um some of them are more just godlike you know burning and fire and some of them are um can you know can kind of disappear and reappear um but some of them are truly monsters basically i mean there's like one guy who can turn into a pile of insects right i mean that's a monster <laughs> yeah but i mean he's to still me. at at base a person yeah you know so it's a character yeah, yeah well, uh, right. i mean an awful lot of monsters are like originally human like there's a whole category of, like it said zombies like we're old vampires i wonder is like uh, it, you know it's like uh, addition to yourself like you know you know, there's one character who can, like, you know, turn to a pile of insects, but if he doesn't think of himself as a monster, is he a monster? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is because, like, you, you have to like, sort of acknowledge you've left humanity behind or you're clinging to it. And they, you know, they, they, uh, <coughs> they somehow defy, even the, the human ones, they somehow defy the natural order, right? Um, human, I mean, humans that we call monsters do things that humans aren't supposed to do, right? Or they're able to do things that humans shouldn't be able to do physically. Um, so yeah, there's that that mm. whole interstitial defying of the natural order kind of kind of thing that always comes into always comes into play. Rob, do you have any uh, last thoughts before we wrap this up? We've only got about two minutes before the recording runs out of time, but do you have any part? Um, I mean, nothing <laughs> nothing new to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I've used Dirk's method before of sort of like taking myths and legends and changing them. Like in, in Never Die, I sort of like, I, I went down a rabbit hole of just hmm. researching like, uh, Chinese and Japanese ghost stories and demons and all sorts. And then, you know, I'd, I'd sort of pick one, like I picked the river dragon and decided how can I change this to make it unique? Um, hmm. So I made it a big tangle of eels. Hmm. Why not? That was um, pretty cool scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, there's, there's other times when it's like, yeah, you sort of like, you you take a sort of physical manifestation of a um, more sort of psychological type thing. I, I always remember like, there's, a, there's an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer where uh, the monster is this this big grotesque thing with like a club arm. And it's sort of, it's, it's actually created by a kid who was abused by... Um, this this sort of like this adult when he was and he's sort of created this monster and in his mind it's turned into this actual monster um, hmm. and things like that I, I find quite interesting where it's it's more of sort of a physical manifestation of of the monster within a person. Great. Well, um, we have to wrap this one up, but. Gareth, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for our listeners slash watchers, if you haven't read The God of Prayer or The Shadow Saint, get onto it. Um, I have not read The Shadow Saint yet, but I love The God of Prayer and I just got The Shadow Saint today. So I will be getting into this very soon. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody.
Thank you for watching Wizards, Warriors and Words. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to like and subscribe to the channel so that we can keep growing this and keep sharing our writing advice with more authors. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.